this, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, and our next speaker is Ulrich Drepper, another returning speaker. Uh, as you probably remember, uh, Ulrich uh, rejoined Red Hat in 2017 after a seven-year hiatus. He's a member of the office of the uh, chief technology officer there. In that capacity, he's looking at upcoming technologies for products and internal application. His focus is mostly on machine learning and low-level, high-performance computing, as well as alternative uh, computer architectures. Previously, Ulrich uh, worked at Goldman Sachs in the technology division data science research. His main interests are in the areas of low-level technologies like machine and processor architectures, programming language, compilers, high performance and low latency computing, and he also worked on several, several revisions of the POSIX standard and was an invited expert for both the C and C++ standard committees. His talk is called C++ and Memory Between Correctness and Performance. Let's warmly welcome on stage Ulrich Drepper. All right, thank, thanks, Raphael. So, slides look very green, so it's supposed to be red, but yeah, so who knows? So, first mal malfunction, yeah. <laughs> All right, so um, the title gives it away, so we're going to talk about memory most of the time today. So, but if you're here to uh, learn about what you can do about this, I have to disappoint you. I don't have enough time for that, for uh, to talk or for telling everyone about how to solve or at least uh, handle the memory a little bit better than we do it today. So I certainly need an entire week, but unfortunately I don't have that much time here now. So I'm mostly talking about the problems and how you can spot them yourself and then you can actually uh, investigate how whether you want to or how you can actually work around them. So and the bigger the study problem around memory most of the time comes from the fact that uh, we live in two different worlds. We have on the one end hardware, the actual hardware which has developed over years, etc. And on the other hand we have programming languages which are actually defined in terms of an abstract machine which has absolutely nothing to do with reality. And that's a problem. Somehow the writers of compilers have to map the abstract machine which is specified by the standards and which you are programming to to something meaningful on the hardware side and depending on the programming language you are choosing this will work differently and since we are going to talk about C and C++ here so we have to st start with C so the goal for the C language as you might have known is to that's the first was an implementation of an operating system. So this will comes from the time of the Multics days and the Unix days, the earliest ones, where you have this programming language, which was already a step forward. Before that, everything was written assembly. And we uh, had all of a sudden a language which, used, uh, which can be used to write everything at the low level. We can express everything uh, in, in terms of... Uh, the source code language, which we want to use at the hardware level. So we still are suffering from that today. So much of what the initial definition of the C language was is really a codifying of what the machines at those days, so let's say the PDP machines, actually looked like. So this was not yet what I just mentioned, that the, the standard was, uh, was really not... Um, specified in terms of an abstract machine. At that point, it was really of a fixed machine. And, uh, well, to make the language uh, more usable, as a first step, it was abstracted out from the PDP to something more general. And the language didn't really do that well in this step. So many of the, the details uh, still remain, and but many others uh, were simply left out and, as I said, up to the compiler writer to actually make any sense. And uh, because the language was also meant to be understand, understood by humans and 
uh, that you are able to write code in a meaningful time, etc. So many details of uh, machines were really left out. So it was just understood by the programmers, ah, yeah, if you have to do this, then I have to write the code in a certain specific form. And this form varied from machine to the machine. So to some extent, that worked over the years. But in the end, uh, the hardware actually changed more rapidly than the programming languages. So we had very early on uh, the, the need to get faster, uh, uh, faster processors through whatever means necessary was there. And one of the biggest issues when it came to that was, uh, was memory. So the other one was parallelism, which was not really dealt with in any of the C, C++ standards until the most recent revisions, some of them, where finally threads, etc., were introduced. Not that this is a good thing, but the biggest problem was is it was really memory at that those times. So memory in the early days, in the times when C and C++ were really uh, developed, was really straightforward. We only had to deal with the concept of registers and memory at that point. So registers were really very fast memory available in the processors themselves for certain resources. But everything else was in memory. It was flat, it was uniformly addressable, and it was uniformly uh, accessible in time as well. So everything was nice. So, But very quickly on, we got the concept of caches because the speed of the processor itself uh, increased much, much more quickly than we were able to scale the memory itself. So the early, uh, let's say, even the early x86 processors and so on, they were using static memory, so or, uh, some form of them, like the 8080 processors and so on, they were using static memory, but that memory uh, was not really usable in large amounts, and so we switched over to DRAM, and the DRAM speed simply is not up to uh, the levels that we can keep up in any way or form with the speed of the processor. So we got these caches to work around them. But that's a concept which is completely alien to the, uh, uh, to the programming language standards. So other things uh, in this area also are, for instance, architectures which try to optimize the memory handling by forcing alignment of data types. Initially, this, this concept didn't really exist. So this had to be introduced in the language itself. And uh, the, uh, the language itself was not really updated itself. Everything was up to the programmer uh, to do. So one big step in the C language, which was not in a language like Fortran at that time, was that we had the concept of dynamic memory. And this mean meant that, well, given additional resources, which we got through the evolution of machines, we were able to take advantage of uh, the, the additional memory to solve larger problems and not like in the early Fortran days, in those days, where we had to define everything statically and the entire maximum working set size had to fit into DRAM. In with dynamic memory, we only had to fit the memory which was used at any point in time into, into the memory itself which is a big step forward, and it actually brought us a lot of effici efficiency, but that led us down the red hole of actually managing dynamic memory, and C never ever tried to solve this problem in the first place. So with C++, uh, we had not much help in the early days, so th I don't know whether anyone really remembers the R manual, the annotated reference manual for C++ for a long time, the only thing which you could get which was close to something like uh, the, the standard document. We only got a standardized C++ in 1998 with a revision which was available at that, was made available at that time. And it inherited everything bad from the C language. So diamond link memory allocation was pretty much done the same way. So it was now shrouded behind a couple of new keywords. So we had new and delete there. But we also had, to some extent, you can say, a little bit more help in that. We can automatically call uh, constructors, etc., to initialize memory while we are actually allocating it. But that's not really that much of an help. So the, it, it, it solved some of the problems, but not really many of them. So you, to actually 
get something out of the uh, C++ language, even in those days, you actively had to change your code. You actively had to make sure it, uh, there, there were changes uh, to tell the compiler and the runtime about the memory which you have allocated and, uh, well, what has to be done in terms, of for, for instance, I if uh, a variable is not needed anymore. So uh, the best you can do in these kind of things is, of course, you define good destructors, but for dynamically allocated memory itself, this does not really help. So you have to actively tell, for instance, in, in a catch block, well, delete this memory once I'm leaving the scope. But there's no automation in there. There's nothing really uh, which is any better than what we had in the C days. So yes, this works a little bit better when it comes to automatic variables, so variables which are allocated usually on the stack, wi which uh, is something uh, was, was not really that doable in C anyway, but in C++ we can define a variable on as an automatic variable, and if that variable allocates dynamic resources by itself, well, we can automatically invoke uh, destructors uh, when it comes to uh, when, when it the lifetime of the variable, the automatic variable, is, is ending. So that's the only way when we actually get something automatically from the language, nothing else. So problems are plenty. So let's go through this little tiny little bit piece of code. So you, you can, if you want to look through it. So the first thing is, uh, it's, it's not really obvious if you do so, but if you look at the code itself, the constructors and so on, you will see that all of a sudden, yeah, you can have uh, pointers which are really uninitialized. There's not necessarily anything in the compilers which can keep track of all of these kind of things. So there are coding conventions which can help you catch these kind of things, but normally it's not uh, up to the compiler to, to find all these kind of things. Second thing is that uh, we have, uh, in this case, for instance, P2 as a, as a pointer. We are using it as an, as a, an array, initializing as, as an array. But there's nothing in there which uh, tells the deletion function, so the constructor run, that this is an array, it's just a pointer. That's uh, the big problem of the uh, C, C++ standard still basically transforming a point, uh, point an array into a normal pointer. So we have to, at this point, use a different delete. So the delete for the array actually to make this useful, but now it's not the case. Next thing is, that we might actually not um, uh, call the appropriate delete function in this case. So P3 was initialized, it's dynamically allocated, but no constructors running. We are not catching these kind of things either. And the worst case, actually, in many cases, because it's the most security relevant as well, is a double deletion. So in this case, for instance, if you have a function, if you call, in this case, you see G is called, and once the, the function f at the bottom goes out of, uh, is, is returning, the object o go out, goes out of uh, scope, and voila, you have double, uh, double uh, invocation of delete on the point of b4. That's not something which is caught statically by the compiler in the language, so we have to do something about that. So, uh, well, the, fi the final thing is that's not really that much of an issue in this in, in for this piece, piece of code, but looking forward, so we can potentially have, if we, ha we, have, we are building up lists, et cetera, so we might actually have uh, circular pointers and so on. So that's just something to keep in mind. So what we got from the experiences with this, uh, with the initial C++ standard is that we need to have something which is better. We need to have some form of automation which can deal with these issues, or at least some of them, automatically. It, uh, if it's up to the programmer, C++ 1998 is not any better than C at all. So we need to have actually something with where the, the, uh, the runtime and to some extent the compiler are helping us to uh, get something better I in place. So one potential technology in there is called garbage collection, which is not originating in the C++ world. That's much, much older. Uh, garbage collection is something which was uh, developed initially for one of the first programming languages, actually the second one. So it's called for Lisp. But there is a guy, so Hans Böhm is the, the picture here. Uh, Hans wrote 
uh, a garbage collector which could be used inside C++ programs and for C++ memory allocation. So what is garbage, garbage collection? So as the name suggests is that there is some service which is taking out well, the garbage, the stuff which is not used anymore. So, and how this works, I'll try to explain now in a couple of slides. So what we have to do in terms of, uh, for any kind of garbage collection system is we have to define what's called the root set. So that's the, that's the set of pointers which are known to be, well, not necessarily reference anywhere else, but more importantly that from these pointers on through some form of pointer following, we reach all the objects in the system which are meaningful still at any point in time. And that, that's an important sentence, so because we have to also think about the reverse of that, which means any object which is not reachable through one of the root objects or uh, objects in the root set is not useful anymore. And that's the part which we want to actually get to. So I have on the right hand side, you see there is it's, it's supposed to represent a little bit of memory. So where we have the root set, which are consisting of pointers, and I really apologize, so it looks much better on my screen. So it's, uh, it's, it's bright colors here, it's there, so I don't know what's going on. And um, the, uh, the pointers in themselves are pointing to the beginning of a couple of memory regions. So and the memory regions themselves are can, can contain pointers. So these are these blocks there, which you see this uh, with, with the dot in there and with the arrow coming out. So with that, all of the memory regions which you see here now represented there, so the white ones and the green ones, uh, so the white ones, sorry, are, are, are used. So they're all, uh, all in use at the time when this snapshot is taken. So now, now what happens if you have a, uh, have a uh, removal of a pointer from the root set. This can be done by overwriting the variable, for instance, uh, zeroing it out, etc. So all of a sudden, this pointer is going out of scope. So what this happens is not just the object which the pointer is directly pointing to is, is, is not usable anymore, so it's now green, uh, uh, well it's actually yellow here, uh, so it's it's uh, it's it's yellow now in this case, which indicates that it's free. But you see, there's also a, a little block in there, which is a pointer, which is also now freed, and therefore we have to recursively go and say, oh yeah, by the way, this one is also uh, also supposed to be free, and therefore this block is now also to be garbage collected. This is how the system works internally. So it does it a little bit differently. It doesn't do it at the time when we are freeing things, or more, uh, uh, what actually happens behind the scenes is that the garbage collector kicks in all the, uh, every once in a while, is following all the valid pointers, and marks this memory regions, and then all the remaining memory regions are garbage, and they can be recollected, so. And um, in, a, in a language like, uh, like Lisp and so on, this is much, much easier, because there we don't have to have we don't have pointers by itself, so no object has a specific address in C++, it's much, much more of a problem because we cannot just arbitrarily move objects around. So for instance, if you wanted to merge the two yellow versions, which you see there, to make one continuous large block, well, we cannot just move this one white block in the middle there. So that's possible in other languages, but not in C++. The other problem which we have with the garbage collection system is that, well, think about this, uh, this uh, case here again, how do we actually find out which other pointers are part of the, the memory region which we have now marked free? So that's actually something which, again, in languages like Lisp, is very easy because everything is either an atom or a pointer, and we, we know that from, from, the, uh, from the representation of the objects in there, but this is not the case in C++. We could, in theory, nowadays use introspection. We can use the type system to get this, but this is all optional. So a garbage collector like the one which we have here, so the, the worm, worm garbage collector, cannot rely on that. So what they're actually doing is to pessimistically do something where they're scanning the memory region which I've read and looking at something which might be a pointer and using this or the other way around how it actually works, it looks through the memory region. If something looks like a pointer, they are adding it to the appropriate uh, uh, use list, 
optimistic. Uh, so it's the pessimistic version of what I just uh, we previously explained. So you can already see that, yes, this can work to some extent. So there are programs out there which are doing this, but A, they have been heavily penalized at runtime for something which is uh, it which is um, should should be done perhaps differently. So it's just a lazy programmer side to do this in, in C++ in my opinion. It's not something which we will likely see wide adoption of just because of that. So there is an effort in the C++ community to actually have a garbage collection as part of the standards. So I don't think we will see this anytime soon or whether maybe never uh, at all. So I it's just one of the bridge projects. So we actually have to find something else. So there are ways which have been added to the uh, uh, C++ standard to actually do this a little bit more automatic. So, but let's first look at the other problem which we have. So before we go to the dynamic allocation, we uh, look, uh, first have to look at the difference between dynamic allocation and uh, automatic allocation. That's another big problem which uh, many people are not really understanding. And they are uh, get getting themselves into problems. So we are going back to the dynamic allocation very soon. So we have, in this case here, a little piece of code, which you see on the left-hand side there, all using C++11 functionality and stuff, where we have a data type now called array. So people uh, have always wanted to have this data type, uh, but previously people always assumed that vector is exactly the same as array, but it's not. Array is something else, and this is already indicated by the additional uh, template parameter, which is supposed to represent the number of elements in the array. So, which means that this object, this array object, has a fixed size. And as such, it can be allocated as one single object. So a vector by itself, and we're getting back to this in uh, very soon, uh, is consists not of just one memory region, but of two memory regions. It's the object itself and the dynamically allocated portion of it, so because it can be resized. But in array, it's not the case. So it's actually a, a single piece of memory. And the way the compilers we are using today is allocating this is by putting the appropriate memory region on the stack. And that's what you can see on the uh, right-hand side. So these two uh, instructions here are the ones, and this is Exodus 6 assembly, so I'm, I'm using that because it's the most familiar for, for people. But uh, it looks pretty much the same for every, th every kind of architecture out there. So the, uh, the array allocation, if you want to call it that, is consists of just the, uh, well, the, uh, the, of the first instruction, and the deallocation is the second instruction, which is highlighted there. So it's very, very simple, actually, and very fast. So why would we not want to use it all the time? Well, the problem is that stacks are limited in size for very good reasons. And if the number of elements of the array is going to grow, this means that the subtract from the stack pointer, which you see there as the first instruction, gets larger and larger, and at some point it would overflow the, uh, the size of the array. So we have uh, today some mediations in the compiler to prevent this from being exploitable, so at least when you en enable these kind of things. But this, this, is this kind of problem was one of the biggest problems we had in the past for for security problems, where we have array objects on the on the stack, which can be in some way or form be influenced from the outside, and all of a sudden you have code which can be executed there. So and so th that's not really a, a good idea. So therefore, using standard array on uh, as automatic variable. Uh, for anything but very, very sh small sizes is really a bad idea. But the language does not prevent you from doing this. The library does not prevent you from doing this. And the compiler doesn't help you to do that. You have to make the decision yourself. So ideally, perhaps at some point, we might uh, get some analysis software to do this. But uh, for the time being, you really want to, uh, want, want to get uh, uh, you really in, in situations when you have lots of uh, memory requirements, you want to use something else. So it's not 
that you want to uh, you don't want to have the speed of, of array, but well, you need to have the dynamic allocation instead. So this is how we arrive at the right hand side now. So you see that the code itself, except for the definition of the variable itself, so the AR variable, is looking pretty much the same. So the the, the, the uh, right-hand side, it creates, instead of an array, it creates a vector, and as already said, a vector itself consists of two memory objects. One is the vector object itself, which, cons uh, which contains a pointer to the actual memory allocated for the content of the vector, and that part is not in the, uh, on the stack in the automatic variable side. It's dynamically allocated, and therefore it's not subject to the same limitations under the stack. So that's that's good. So, what do you think is the difference the co uh, when when it comes to runtime for these uh, two pieces of code? So it's aside, of course, from the fact that uh, the right hand side has a, a dynamic memory location and deallocation location in the end. So do you think it's pretty much the same? Otherwise. And of course, I'm asking the question in a certain leading way. So everyone says, yeah, it's identical. And I say, no, I got you. So the question is now, how different is it? So, and here's the assembly code generated for both of those. So uh, the right hand side, as expected, is a little bit longer. But the biggest, uh, so, and these pieces of code here, uh, the, the call to the IOTA function and the accumulate function and so on, they're pretty much the same. So on the right hand and the left hand side, actually there's a bug in GCC. Currently this is what this, there's this one instruction on the, in the um, uh, array using code, which is completely unnecessary inside the loop. So, but that's a GCC bug. But aside from that, that code is really, really identical. So. But that's the part here which, which is in question. So it's not the allocation. The allocation is before that. You see there is a call instruction for new. But there is some additional code there. Anyone wants to gather, make a guess what this is? Well, the problem is that the standard uh, requires that for a vector, the the default constructor, which we have been using in, uh, sorry, the, the size constructor, which we have been using in this case, is calling the default constructor for the elements. In this case, 100 times the default constructor for an int, the default constructor for an int is store zero in it. Which means that even though, in, as in the source code itself, we are initializing the entire vector right after allocating it, before we are actually getting to the point, we have already written into every single element a zero, which just gets rewritten after that. So it's completely uh, different in this respect. So it's much, much more expensive than just the dynamic memory allocation. So there, so th there is a big problem when it comes to this. So we can, to some extent, work around this. So if you're really up to getting all kinds of speed, so you can change the code which we had before uh, using something like that. And again, this, these two lines are supposed to be red. And um, but you have to really jump through hoops to make this work. You have to uh, do the allocation in in a way which is not really that easily uh, understood. So you have to res reserve the memory itself, and then use something called a back inserter. So this version of the code would actually uh, prevent the, the initialization from going on at the same time, uh, but we cannot, in this case, even use the IOTA function anymore. We have to roll it ourselves because the interfaces are not there. So this, in my opinion, is the problem that because we encourage people to use all the functions which the standard library is providing, but they are not really that uh, usable in all the situations, especially when it comes to actually trying to persuade the compiler and runtime to do exactly what we want to do. There's, there are so many limitations which, ha which are baked into the existing libraries when it comes to memory. And just for the sake of security, but well, there's, there's not really a, oh, trust me, I know what I'm doing part anymore. And well, 
if you are not willing to accept that, you have to jump through hoops to actually make it work. And most people really don't even know that these kind of prompts exist. And if they, uh, even if they don't know what they exist, how to work around them. And there, are, this is just one tiny little example. But this thing is not really the, the full solution by itself either, because the compilers don't really see this as such uh, as what it is supposed to do. So it's not really the equivalent of the array code because it does not look through the back inserter use uh, that much. So what we really want to have is a completely different implementation of the arrays and so on. So there are uh, there are classes out there which can be formulated in terms of additional functionality, which we now have in the C++ standard. We now have uh, uninitialized memory allocation and these kind of things. We can write our own code to do this kind of thing, but this to some extent subverts the, the purpose of the, the programming language standard because we have this well-tested library and now we are forced to again write our own code to solve some of the issues. So Again, so this is not to talk about solutions, it's to talk about the problems. So, again, so th that's, that's just the, uh, the problem itself. Uh, then that's, I'm not going to do that. Back to the problem of dynamic memory location. So I mentioned that the previously that uh, garbage collection is a potential solution for that, but it's a way to check out, and because of the way the language is defined, the pessimistic garbage collection mechanism, which would have to be implemented, is really suboptimal, in my opinion, even uh, not really worth it. So in most cases, it's something which can be done in some situations, but not really if you want to have a reliable program. So one way around this is also something which has existed for a long time. Many programming languages are, are built around these kind of things. It's called reference counting. We can implement this in C++11 and forward very efficiently now. We have data types which we arrived at after long discussions, and one of them is, for instance, the shared pointer data type. So hopefully you are already aware of that. So shared pointer just means that, oh yeah, I'm specifying an object type, and I have, instead of just using the asterisk to say, well, this is a pointer of this type, we are using the, the standard shared pointer template type to specify, oh yeah, here's a separate type which is a pointer to this object. So this all works, so if you have well-structured code, the amount of changes which you have to do to actually make it compile, and note the word here is only compile, I'm not saying anything about well-performing, uh, to make it compile can be really small. You cannot have in your code any, uh, any uh, assumptions built in that the uh, pointer is just four or eight bytes in size, depending on whether you have a 32-bit or 64-bit architecture. So if you have that, well, you cannot use shared pointers. But that, that's really usually not the case. No, normally you should not do that because, well, you, that's not really portable across architectures anyway. So and therefore, it's, it's oftentimes not the case that you have this limitation, and therefore using shared pointers is surprisingly often uh, quite easy to do. So. Let's take a look at the code which you have here uh, at the bottom there. So it's a, a various pieces of um, a, a couple of functions which are using sh uh, shared pointers, etc., to do various uh, various things. And uh, I, I should point out there's a function called make shared, which is just a, fu a template function which uh, uses behind the scenes all kinds of magic to create a shared pointer object of the specified type from the object itself. So in this case, it returns, uh, so the function f just returns an, an, uh, such a shared pointer object of the of the int type in this case. So it takes the int and creates an object, a dynamically allocated object, stores the value of a in it, and returns the shared pointer, not a normal pointer. So in g itself, where the function is called, it first creates this pointer, so it it's behaves to some extent just like a normal pointer, so I can dereference it using the asterisk operator, and I get an int out. So the return p, uh, star p plus uh, b is, is in end effect nothing but uh, an addition of two ints, 
and it works. And the nice thing is that when the uh, function g returns, it knows that p is a pointer, and it dynamically, uh, well, it calls a destructor for uh, the shared pointer type, which itself does the dynamic deallocation. So if, uh, in this case, p would be a simple int pointer, uh, recall that no such deallocation, automatic deallocation, would happen. Only if you are using, in this case, shared pointer as a type, it will automatically be done. So that's good. That's exactly what we want. So we can uh, call this code. In this case, they have a little, uh, a little function uh, main at the bottom. So we call g in this way. And well, this code will work really well. It will work correctly. But yeah, it's, it's really not that. Uh, uh, that's it's it's much it, the compiler generates a lot more code than what we can uh, what we normally expect if we use normal pointers. So the uh, the uh, in this case, yeah, it's green. The green regions there are uh, the, uh, those which are corresponding to the function f. Function f is inlined in the function g in this case, and so on. So that's the and the rest of it is is overhead. So you see that. And what sticks out more, if you know a little bit of x86 architecture, uh, is the, uh, the there are a couple of instructions in there which are using well s something which is uh, which is um, related to threading and so on. So we're getting more into this at the very end. So hopefully I will have the time to do that, but. To actually understand how this code works, we have to look at what is the implementation of a shared pointer actually. So, and this is specifically so the names specifically in this case are coming from the uh, uh, GCC's uh, C++ library implementation. It will vary depending on what implementation you are using, but not really that much in in theory. So the so what a pointer object, a shared pointer object, really consists of is the actual pointer, in this case underscore m pointer at the very bar, uh, very top, which you see there, and the second thing is a pointer to a reference counting object. So each, uh, when, when well, sorry, uh, when you are creating a, a, a shared pointer object, we are not creating having one single memory location going on. We have actually two. So why do we why do we have to have two? Why don't we have one where Everything is 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 stuffed in the in the first record. Well, the thing is that if you're doing assignment of shared pointers, you you are not really assigning the the value it is. You are just incrementing reference counter and pointing to the same object twice. And the same object twice in this case is means that we have to reference the same reference counting object from multiple instantiations of the uh, shared pointer object. So. We have to have it separately. So this is a pointer by itself. And the interesting thing there is that we actually have three different types of implementations there. So there are the, the difference, you see them at the bottom. So there can be more, uh, more or less complicated depending on, on, on uh, what kind of type you're using. So it's not really that important. Uh, why this is such a difference? And the, 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 the colors really throw me off. And the uh, but the, the point is that depending on what kind of type you're using, you're getting one of these uh, one of these different uh, implementations in there, and you see that it's it's quite a lot more complicated than what it looks like from the outside. So let, let's let's talk about. Uh, the other consequences, not just the representation, but also the consequences of using shared pointers. So in this case, we are looking at uh, passing objects of, um, which are shared, uh, shared pointers. So of course, you can pass normal pointers, so just type star objects very easily. They're more or less looking like integers and so on, so they're very quick in passing and so on. But as you have seen here, shared pointer objects consist of more than that. So they cannot be just stored in a single register usually. And therefore, uh, passing them around is a lot more complicated as well. So there are, in general, yeah, I have listed here three different ways how you can do this. So you, you see the function f1 on the left-hand side. 
is the pointer object, uh, the pointer type in this case is point at as is as an object on the um, on the uh, top one on the right hand side it's pointed as a reference and on the bottom side I use the normal pointer object so just for reference how it looks like and if you look at the code which gets generated for each of those you see the difference so the one which you are used to from a normal pointer object uh, from a normal pointer to into uh, to an object and stuff you see the the bottom right hand side this is how it looks like uh, normally. So this is what you expect. You get in one register, in this case RDI register, you get the pointer object passed. The only thing which a function has to do is dereference it. So it dereference loads it in a register, and then adds the other value to it and returns it. So that's how it should look like. But if you're using shared pointers object as this, you as you can see in the other two cases there, we have an additional, de uh, in, in additional indirection going on there because we have the object itself which is passed by reference as a pointer. So we have to first dereference it. Itself, it contains the pointer. So we have to load that part. And then we can load the, the variable itself. So this is, of course, clearly quite significantly slower than uh, a normal object would be, a normal pointer object. So just blindly using shared pointer as a type replacing it with uh, existing pointer objects is really not a good idea if you care about performance. So, and how does it look like on the side of the function which is actually trying to do, uh, doing the calling? So the, the previous slide was how it looked like on the function which we call. So in this case, we have the functions which actually do the calling. And the, you see it's quite different there for, for all of them. So for uh, let's start again on the bottom right-hand side. This is how it normally looks like. So the only thing we have to do for that is create actually, so the, the first line is nothing but, well, we have to, what, what used to be the first parameter is now the second parameter. Well, it's a very simple thing. But the second line there, the second instruction is it creates a pointer from the global object itself, and then it jumps to the, uh, the to implementation of the function to do that. So it's very simple, very quick. So the uh, the use of a reference for the uh, for the pointer object, which you see on the right hand side, the the, the top part, is also quite appealing. And in this case, uh, passing a reference to a pointer might be intuitively nonsensical, but if it comes to a passing a reference to a shared pointer object, it makes all the sense in the world if the uh, semantic of your code allows it. Because we don't have to generate a new shared pointer object, we can just use the existing one, So, which means that we just have to pass the pointer to the object, which is we already got, in, in this case in the T2 function, as a parameter to the newly called uh, function, so the function F2 in this case. So that's much better than the left-hand side, where we are actually calling into the function uh, f1, which takes the, a new, as an actual object of type shared pointer, and we have to dynamically create this and initialize it from the object, which in this case the function t1 has uh, has gotten as a parameter. So a lot more code behind the scenes. So if you're not aware that this kind of thing is happening, you might think that, oh yeah, I'm just always using shared pointers. But it's not uh, a good idea if it comes to performance. So one of the, or some of the problems can be solved by using a different construct, which is also in the standard, and that's the unique pointer type. So that's something which is semantically clean to define and therefore was added to the standard itself. The implementation of a unique pointer is very different from a shared pointer because a unique pointer does not have to, uh, or, or it does not allow that you have more than one valid pointer at a time pointing to the same dynamically allocated object. There's only exactly one owner at the time. And as soon as that owner goes out of scope, the object gets deallocated. So the representation for that, again, in Axity, uh, so I'm sorry, in uh, uh, GCC's implementation looks like that. It uses uh, a tuple object, and the magic of the tuple object uh, allows it to be defined this way. So it, there's, an, there's a deleter 
part of the, so the second element of the tuple itself, which gets instantiated there, but for most data types, the deleter itself is not a real object, it's, not, it's, a data it's a structure which zero size, and therefore the tuple actually degenerates to a single value, and it has a pretty efficient representation there. So that's really s some smart Swiss went into the implementation and definition of that. But this does not mean that this implementation is really uh, that easy to use, the data type. So the good news is that, similar to for the shared pointer type, we have a function called make unique, which helps us with allocating things. And I, sh I should mention at this point, if you have code which is using sh shared pointers or unique pointers and you're allocating them with anything other than make unique and make shared, your code is wrong. Change it. Th there is no reason to not do that. So that's, a, and that's an aside. So in this case, so the, the code is very similar to what we have looked at before. So it, the only thing is that we have now this uh, unique object and there instead of a um, in, in, instead of a shared object itself. So let's take a look at, uh, if we want to call it this, the function like that, the good news is that, well, in, in I should ha actually have changed the frown to, to a smile because it's actually a good thing. The compiler tells us that we are doing something wrong. So what are we doing wrong? So remember, unique pointer means that there can be only one owner. But if we are passing the object A, in, in the case of the function G in this case, uh, to F, which itself takes one of these pointers an object, we actually have two uh, unique pointer objects with both are pointing to the same memory. Cannot work. So what do we have to do in both of these cases? We're using standard move. So standard move is something which comes into play a lot with uh, R value references and so on. I'm talking about this quickly uh, as well. But here in this case, it just means that, oh yeah, the ownership or the, uh, the actual definition of, you know, in the case of the function G, of the object A is transferred over to the uh, callee, to the function uh, F in this case. So what does it mean for the code we are actually generating there? Well, let's take a look. So the function F, is looking very much like the ones which we had before for the make shared case. We need to have an additional indirection. So we cannot work around this by just uh, using unique pointer as opposed to shared pointer. It should be logical in this case. But there's another thing. You see here, there's nothing else going on. So when, we, uh, when you look at the code there in function G, it says std move, now the ownership of the object itself is to function F. And, well, function f itself is not necessarily, in this case, in the position of, well, or, or it doesn't do anything about the lifetime of the object itself. So it doesn't really call any, any destructors in this case. So, which means that the function g, in this case, is looking terribly complicated. So the code which you are generating there. Because, yes, so the, the lighter part which you see here is the allocation and deallocation part. And what is actually darker here, which is actually brighter on my screen, uh, is, is the part which is in addition to uh, necessary. So this actually implements the, uh, the std move, and then it has the function call. And after the function call there, you see these, uh, these highlighted area in the bottom there. It still calls the deallocation. So why does it have to do the deallocation? Well, because function f, in this case, might not have deallocated the object. But it also cannot do it unconditionally because the function might have done that. So you see there, there's a jump equal, the je instruction in front of it. It has to actually test dynamic, dynamically at runtime that the caller do something to the object to deallocate it. So all of a sudden, what looks like a simple thing there, so if you have a um, pointer by itself, becomes much more complicated. In the case of the shared pointer, we didn't have to do this testing because we always just did the deallocation, which meant inc uh, decrementing the reference counter. But then, and then based on the reference counter, we were doing the dynamic deallocation. But in this case, we have to do it explicitly here. So, and uh, it's no better for the other function, h there. So it, it just looks a little bit different, but yeah. So 
it's, it has a lot of code. So, and for reference, this is how it can look like if we change the uh, function f to take a normal pointer. So, here is the entire code for all three functions. So, it's much, much better. And in this case, you have to see, you have to bring in your own knowledge of the program into the program itself, not just blindly use a uh, shared pointer, unique pointer. If you know that the function f in this case is just taking the object itself, doing something but not touching it, so you could in theory also add a constant there on top of that, uh, then define the function as such. Even if the rest of the program is using unique pointer and shared pointer and so on, you can always get an actual pointer from either of these objects. So you see there in the end, uh, in, the, in the H function and so on, both of these function type, uh, uh, type fun types there, so the unique pointer, shared pointer, have a function called get, with from, from which can be used to get an actual pointer to the object itself. So it's the actual dereference. So that function always exists. And when you write a, a function itself which takes an object, and you, uh, which you normally handle through either unique point or shared point, because that's the right way of doing it to, ha to, to handle dynamic memory location, but that function is not touching the dynamic uh, memory location part. By all means, write it using normal pointers. Otherwise, the code which you're getting out of the whole thing is looking horrendous. And the, the, best, the worst part there is that your source code doesn't look any worse. In this case, actually, the source code here might be a little bit more uh, stranger to look at because you have to somehow define the, the, uh, the type for the, uh, the object which you're pointing there. So I'm using there the type name and then the element type, etc. So this kind of thing. But the, the source code itself is really not looking any more problematic. So you have to bring in this yourself. The compiler will not do this automatically for you. So R value references are not really helping you with that. So that's another it's an extension of C11, has been there since then. So we can in theory define the object. So the, the function f in this case you see there is taking now instead of a normal function object, it takes an R value reference and so on. But the code which we are getting out of this is not looking any better. Uh, as opposed so in contrast now we have shifted the complexity to the function f, where it has to has to do the deallocation. Well, previously this was not necessary because the object itself, so it, it got an object passed, etc. But this tells the compiler, oh yeah, the caller takes respons responsibility uh, for the lifetime of the object. With an R value reference, it tells the compiler, oh yeah, the ownership now passed to the caller, which is very good in many situations. Don't get me wrong, our value reference are one of the best things in there. But using it blindly is not a good thing. So you see the code which is generated, there's huge amounts of code. You have to do something better than that. All right, so scared you enough. We can go one more level and one level lower and talk about the allocators, but uh, I'm not going to do that much because there's an entire talk just about allocators later on, so I think it's following me. So I'm, I'm just talking a, cup, a couple of things in there. So just the basics. Allocators were introduced also in the in late in the C++ standards, so nowadays every single container object can have an additional uh, template parameter, which is an allocator itself. And during the constructors, we can actually pass, since C++11, actual objects which can have state to the, uh, to the constructor itself. And, um, and from that point on, all the memory which is allocated for the container. So inside the container implementation is then not using the global new function or the global, ma and in this case, falls back to the malloc function, but instead it is using that specific allocator, which is a nice thing. So we can do all kinds of magic with that. So we can implement obstack like things, etc., cetera, using, uh, using this. But the one thing which I want to point out in this context is that, for instance, in this case, I'm, uh, uh, if I create an allo allocator object A in this case, and then I'm creating an, a list object which is using this allocator. So if I'm then creating two elements, the result will look something like that. So I have variable L in this case, which points to an object 
which, which is usually double linked list in this case, which points to the first element and then the second element from that on, and there's also back pointers, etc. So I left out a couple of details. But it's quite different in reality, so if you look at that, because the, f uh, the object itself, the vector object, is allocated by the global system allocator, while only the elements inside the container itself are allocated using the allocator A. So uh, it's, it's very hard to see. There's a, there's a blue A at the bottom there, so which is actually violet on my screen. Uh, so, but this, this is a difference which comes into play, for instance, if you implement an allocator uh, for something like a shared memory region, which is uh, shared between two processes, which have completely different address spaces. You need to have the entire state in there. And uh, not only the, the content of the containers, but the containers themselves. So you have to be a lot more careful when it comes to the uh, allocation of objects. So again, there's an entire talk about allocators later on. So the last thing, and I have this very brief actually, because this is another thing which you can talk an entire day about, is the memory model. That's something which got finally introduced in the, in the C++ standards and also the C standards, but only because we had, uh, well, well both of these standards also saw the concept of threads introduced. And memory, uh, memory models were useful before, but they're absolutely essential to define when it comes to uh, concurrency inside the code. So if you take a look at this code, which you see here on the, on, on the screen itself, we have this variable C, which is a, some form of counter. And I'm creating a couple of threads, T1, T2, T3. They're all running the same function. And the function does nothing in this case, but incrementing the function C. So if you execute this code, what is the result? What is the output? Well, output is C equals 1, C equals 2, or C equals 3. And maybe even in some situations you can argue that it none of the above. It might be anything, because this is actually undefined behavior. The problem is that we are accessing potentially concurrently the same memory object. We're incrementing something there. And the implementation of the increment operator could, for instance, specifically on risk machines, consist of loading it from memory, incrementing the, the value itself, so adding one to the register value and writing the register value back. But if the content, if the three, th uh, the three threads in this case are all uh, executing the move instruction, the load instruction, at the same time ahead uh, as the first instruction, they all get, in this case, zero, and they're all writing back one. So it's not the right thing. So we need to have something better than that. So And we already saw that at the beginning. I mentioned that the shared pointer type is, is actually prepared for handling threads, and we have uh, concepts in there to actually do this. But the origin is of the problem is just like, as I mentioned at the very beginning, that we have the abstract representation of the language itself, where we used to have a single executor, so whatever you the term is. Nowadays, we have multiple of them. And this somehow has to be mapped to the real hardware, where we have multiple uh, ex concurrently executing cores. Each of them has different registers. So comes into play with, with, um, uh, with the order of the moves. We have caches to deal with, and we have different memory regions to deal with. And none of that is really reflected in the language itself. And the memory models, which are defined by the, uh, by the standards themselves, are a compromise. Keeping uh, or building a compiler, which is mapping the abstract model of the language standards to something which executes exactly in the same way as the, as the abstract machine is demanding it, is in theory possible. But the resulting code would be extremely slow. So we are not doing it. So the result is that unless you're actually telling the compiler to do the right thing at, at certain points in time, uh, you will get surprising results. So we used to do something as simple using atomics, atomic instructions uh, using uh, magic, using in this case GCC magic, by using inline assembly. 
and some because there was no other way around this. We had no support in the, in the, in the language to do something better. Good news is that nowadays we can do something better. So the C++ standard has an atomic template type. And if we, in the, in the previous example, would have defined the variable C not as an int, but as a standard atomic int, all of a sudden we would have gotten much better result. But the uh, cost is that instead of having a single add instruction for uh, generated for, in this case, a function C account, in this case, the, um, the addition, we have this log prefix added on top of that. So, and that thing is quite expensive. So it got cheaper over time. Intel has always promised to, uh, to make it basically zero cost, but they haven't managed to actually do that. So it used to be in the time of the Pentium 4, we had something like 100 to 200 cycles for each of these lock instructions in there. We are down, and this is how I measured on my small little laptop here, we are down to an overhead of something like 40 cycles for of a machine which is now f a couple of years old. I think they have reduced it since then a little bit more, something perhaps 20 to 30 cycles. But it's uh, still 20 to 30 times slower than the normal instructions. So you cannot just blindly using the uh, atomic, in this case, uh, all of your code. You have to be mindful of the, case of the case that, well, I need consistency between the abstract model and the real implementation but only in specific points of time. And this is what the memory, where the memory model helps you with. So we have to uh, basically define sequence points, points in the program where the consistency has to be uh, met. And then we can define this, we can fine tune this using what's called the memory ordering. So many of functions like the memory location, uh, so they're sorry, the, the locking functions, the mutexes and so on, they can define, have an additional object as a parameter, which is the memory ordering object, where you can say, oh yeah, I need total ordering here, which means everything which happened before that has to be visible, has to be consistent to very relaxed uh, memory ordering and so on. And for architectures like x86, there's not really that much of a difference because most of the time the architecture itself will enforce uh, most of the requirements of the memory model anyway. But the most extreme case used to be the DEC Alpha machine, which has had the weakest memory model you can, uh, which was ever implemented, and uh, which meant that the, the programs can actually run really, really fast because there's no, no requirement for the processor to get any kind of consistency in place, but only if it was required at certain points and then things slowed down, but we got a uh, consistent uh, state of the program. But we have now inside the, uh, the, the language standards the possibilities to define these kind of sequence points. So if you're interested in these kind of things, if you have to write um, uh, multi-thread codes, or even code using multiple processes and using shared memory, you have to read up on that kind of thing. It's quite complicated mechanisms, and all kinds of things of definition of progress come into play. And you have to pick what is your program's requirement and not just blindly using one thing. So this is another place where A, you can gain a lot of uh, speed, but also if you're being too pessimistic, you can lose a lot of it. So as I said, this was not really a talk about the solutions mostly about highlighting all kinds of problems. So if you are looking for uh, through the standard and trying to read this, especially what was added in the last couple of years, it's uh, quite enlightening to read this. It's actually a fine read. And there are lots of papers out there which define things like, as I said, memory ordering and progress, definition of progress and so on. You have to read them to be an actual good C++, C++ programmer. All right. So I see Raphael is on the sideline. Uh, just prompting people to ask questions. We slightly over, but perhaps just uh, one or two from the audience, just very briefly. Again, simple raising of hands. Very happy and to see. Well, everyone is happy. Okay, can I see one person who's unhappy? It's not like I'm letting you go. <laughs> One question. Well, everyone knew about this. This is another possibility, so I'm boring everyone. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there's one over there. Thank you.
So I have the question uh, about optimization level you used uh, uh, while compiling these examples of uh, unique and shared pointers and overheads they produce. Yes, uh, in this case, I think or this was all, all O2, but uh, I think any optimization level would have produced pretty much the same level because the remaining issues there, which you saw there, are not something which the compiler can solve automatically by itself unless it gets magically uh, additional information um, from the implementation like a need point and shared point. So in theory, yes, we could embed this kind of knowledge inside the uh, in inside the compiler, but then having a function, so most of the function, for instance, these functions were not static. They were not assumed to be in the local namespace. And therefore, they have to be callable from the outside and therefore have to be the worst case scenario. And therefore, yeah, there's not much we can do. So th these functions are so simple that, uh, yeah, they're as well optimized with O1 as they would be ever. My special thanks to you, Ulrich, that, as I said, we are planning so many technical malfunctions and uh, you are kind well, enough to deliver welcome, the first yes. one. As you can see, it was supposed to be red hat and you can see you could see no red on screen. Exactly. And it's so all very it nice here on my side. Absolutely. Yeah, it's fabulous. I saw it. It's so I wish, nice I wish, guys, you, you could have seen that and you couldn't. So uh, technically and officially, the technical malfunction we can tick. Uh, in green, and let's thank for it and for his wonderful talk, Ulrich Trepper. Yeah.